Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, yes, indeed, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm exceptionally well, thank you, Rory, and we're very grateful that you've joined us for episode 249 of the Counselling Tutor podcast, if you're listening in real time. It's a brand new year. Uh, new episode, new year, and a slightly different format as well. We like to change things up, keep things fresh. We've got three topics we're going to be covering today, starting off with a firm favorite, and that's theory and practice, where we take a little bit of theory and we look at how that presents in practice. And today we're going to be looking at Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grieving and how that might show up in therapy. We then go into a brand new section that Rory has designed for us. It's called Practice Today. And we Within practice today, we're going to be looking at contemporary uh, developments, challenges uh, it, within counselling. What are you facing right now? What are you talking about? And of course, to suggest topics for that, make sure you suggest those in our Facebook uh, group. We'll tell you the information on that in a, in a moment. And then into Practice Matters, can't have a counselling tutor podcast without Practice yeah. Matters, where we take an element of what we may see in practice and learn a little bit about it. It's our CPD section. And today uh, we have Alan Fratt speaking about waking dreams interesting topic looking forward to that well let's kick off this new year this new season of the counseling to to podcast episode 249 rory by checking in with theory and practice and of course the dabda model of elizabeth kubler ross how does that present that theory in our practice rooms well i think before i before i go on to to analyze that i think i'd like to say it's one of the most enduring pieces of theory that that is around not only the counselling profession, but also the helping professions in general. I think that anybody who's a, a helper, be they a therapist, a support worker, a, anybody who helps people in any way has probably come across the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a Swiss-American uh, psychiatrist who has a, a really interesting backstory. She was a She was a cleaner, and then she met someone who helped her become a psychiatrist, which... I think he's a fantastic story. And she she developed through her observations of people who were dying in the process of dying, people of terminal illnesses, um, how they reacted. And one of the very interesting things about this is she didn't actually um, research them as stuff. They, they weren't research participants. She, she It was more observational and more she would talk to them. And she she saw some patterns of behavior and she, she called this uh, the grieving process. And she wrote a book in 1969 called On Death and Dying. And from that book, we get the acronym DABDA. And it said that people go through a, in terms of loss, um, a, a kind of pattern of experiencing and that is is denial so dabda is denial anger bargaining and depression and the the model would would suggest on face value that people go through this in in, in an order people first of all deny there's anything wrong and then once that that that's kind of resolved and they realize there is something wrong they become angry about it and then they're they're bargaining this third stage is all about you know if i do this if i do that Will things change? And then depression, you know, the realisation that, you know, life is is ending. And then eventually acceptance. And I think sometimes this model gets a bit misrepresented, Ken, because it's always presented in a linear format. In other words, it starts with denial and finishes with acceptance. The truth of the matter is, is that many, many people who experience grief may have those um, presenting uh, issues, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, um, in different orders or altogether or miss some of them out. Um, but it is a very useful um, kind of kind of theory to, to, to gain an understanding of how people may react to something as, you know, as, as tragic as, as terminal illness. Yeah, a good good topic that you've brought, and I love this little piece of theory, Rory. And what's interesting, and of course, this was this was um, written in regards to that terminal illness, but mm. it is so adaptable to the grieving process as a whole. So it can be the loss of somebody else. It can be the loss of a pet. 
that's the thing we can see the you, even the loss of, of of something like a car you know we might yes. see this process playing out so there's something very human about the different stages that uh, were identified here that we do go through and i think really smart pointing out rory is that you're not sat there with this number line wait saying right so they're in denial now so next time i see them then we're going to see the anger yeah. then we're going to go into the old bargaining stage it can it can as you say you can you can have uh, two or more of them at the same time in a way or miss things out and and they don't necessarily run in an order but they are something to kind of peg where somebody might be at and to understand it from a human perspective and i'm going to start with that first the denial uh, and i'm going to go i'm going to use a car a car uh, this the, the well-loved car that is parked downstairs and then you get up the next morning and you go downstairs and you look and, and, and the car's gone rory oh gosh the first step the first the denial is where did i park it it can't be gone yeah. i know i locked it i know i locked it so it can't be gone has somebody else used it? Has somebody to have, did I park it in a different place? Am I remembering correctly here? And there's this, I can't believe it element to it um, within that, that, that moment. Then the person might go on to the bargaining and go, well, I can now truly see it's gone because I can see some broken glass where my parking spot was. Now, I wonder had I, if I'd have only bought that steering lock my wife was on at me for how many years to get that steering lock? Oh, I should have put that alarm in. If I'd have put that alarm in, that wouldn't have happened. And that's into the bargaining stage. And that is retrospective bargaining, where you're going into the past saying, if I'd have done things differently then, maybe this wouldn't have happened right now. And, and then, of course, the depression, my car's gone. What am I going to do? Uh, I can't live without my car. I don't know how I'm going to get around. Uh, but of course, life goes on and, and we live on and we make our way through that. And then the acceptance that one day you sat in a pub, Rory, telling somebody the story about the day that your car got stolen. Uh, and yeah. you may be removed from the, the 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 spikiness of the emotions that you felt within that moment. I've, I've taken a very glib example, uh, not related to, to people and, and uh, rather put it on a car, but that's kind of maybe an overview of that Dabda model playing out. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. And I think you've, I think you've hit on an interesting point there. One of the reasons Dabda is presented in the way it is, in a linear form, is, is because it's it's probably the easiest um, theory of loss that can be taught to a wide range of professionals. In fact, if you, if you drill down into the work of Kubler-Ross, and bearing in mind, um, you know, she, she, was a, she was a proper researcher. The person who wrote the foreword to a book was Colin Murray Parks, who was a, you know, who, who is a huge um, influence in studies of loss and grief. So, you know, the, this wasn't just a very short book that said Dabda, and then at the end had some references in. Yeah. There was quite there was there was a lot to it, and also, I think it's worth pointing out that her her um, observations were for people who were dying. So sometimes that model doesn't transpose to people who have lost. Ah. Yes. Um, I, I think I think I think that's that's something that needs to be said, and it has been adapted through the through the years through the years her work has been adapted and modified rather like maslow's hierarchy of needs it, it's been adapted and in fact if you go to um our mother website counselingtutor.com look for podcast episode 249 we'll put a link to um elizabeth kubler-ross's the, the late elizabeth kubler-ross's website and you can see how it's been adapted but it, it remains can an enduring theory yeah. of how to work with grief and loss and um, i think i think it's one that can be taught quite quickly for those people who've never encountered how to work with clients just to have that little acronym in the back of your mind i think is really helpful yeah and for me there's also an, a, a normalizing element in in these stages and, and i'm going to go back to what i was saying how if there's anything that stands out in these stages is how human they are and how how these kind of feelings or emotions show themselves in in different stages of our lives and sometimes and when i speak about normalizing sometimes you may be working with a client who has lost somebody very dear to themselves it could be a partner or, or somebody really close and they lose that person and they might come into therapy and they might be 
quite angry that that person is no longer around. Now they love that person dearly. They're experiencing such grief at the loss of that person. But within them, there's also this, how can, how can he leave me now? How can he go now? How can, and that for that client presenting, and this is what this is about. How does that theory represent itself in practice? It can be hard for them. That could be unacceptable to them. How can I feel this anger towards this person that I've just lost and yeah. that I loved so much? And there's we, we can go to the normalizing where we can explain that this is natural. This is a natural ex experience to be having when, when faced with, with a loss like this. And it can normalize that and maybe give that person a little bit of resolve that it's okay to feel that yeah. anger intermingled in with all of that grief and sadness. Absolutely, Ken. And I, I think that, you know, we talk about psychological education a lot and people people see that in terms of in the frame of trauma, which, of course, you know, grief is a, a form of trauma. But I, I think sometimes just to maybe step out of the person centred pantheon mm. of non directedness and just share that information. I've always been a great believer in information that is going to be helpful to the client. We should share. You know, as, as long as as long as there's no agenda to it, and you know, many times I've shared that in practice and said, you know, and, and sometimes you do you write like can clients will say, why do I feel this way? Mm. You know, why 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 do I hate this person so much for for leaving me? And and that that brings up anxiety and 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 fear and um, shame and all those emotions that are attached to it, and just simply just saying, well, look, you know, this is a this is a process that humans go through. It's been known for a long, long time. And, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, look, you're not going crazy. This is just a natural yeah. progression of grief. And and that can be just so helpful. You're just disabusing them of the of the, the pressure they're putting themselves on. And, you know, if that's not our work, I don't know what is, Ken. Oh, yeah. Well said, Rory. Here, here, I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, another area of this this um, model, I guess, that is interesting to me is the bargaining uh, mm. stage. That if I hadn't, if I had, if I didn't do that, if it had gone like this, if I only listened to, if I'd have read that, if we'd have taken these or whatever that bargaining may be, mm. and we may we may recognise that a client can get stuck there even many years after the loss. That it's a sticky place. The bargaining. Uh, it's almost a that uh, uh, there can be an accepting of if I had acted differently, then then this may have played out very very differently, and that I think is 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 a when we recognise that a client may be in that bargaining phase and being in that bargaining phase for some time, I think there's the 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 patience element of being with them. Yeah, that. and within the bargaining there is an incongruence, and and the incongruence for me, I'm speaking specifically about loss now. So I'll speak about the loss of the car. If I hadn't parked it over there, if I had bought that alarm system, if I'd have put a steering lock on, then this wouldn't have happened. But the truth of the matter is, it did happen. So yeah. there is an incongruence in looking back to it may not have happened, and maybe in a person centered way, you you can you can point to the incongruence when the time is right when the relationship is built up but right saying i recognize that you you really feel that if you'd have done those things in the past differently then maybe it would have played out differently but of course you now find yourself here and pointing again to how it really is what it's like right now bringing them into the here and now but recognizing the, the emotions of the there and then, the bargaining, if I had, if I hadn't, if we had, whatever that may be, that's a sticky place to be. And I think patience there, Rory, is uh, just patience and understanding, care and empathy. Uh, I, I totally agree. And uh, and also, you know, don't be surprised if, if this kind of presentation of grief comes up many, 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 many years after someone has died. Um, because it can be it can be kind of uh, cyclic. That's the word I'm looking for. It can be cyclic. So things like on anniversaries, things like on birthdays, you know, um, you know, Christmas Christmas holidays as we call them now. All those all those things can trigger that kind of cycle, and it can it can it can trigger individual bits of the dab de cycle. So you might get a client you're working with, and all of a sudden they come in just incredibly angry one day. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you you know, you say I notice that you, you seem really angry, and it might be that you know that, that's the that is the the symptom, if you like, 
of the fact that there's a special day, it could be a birthday, it could be a holiday, that person isn't there. And they, they're just very angry about it, that they've 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 left them. And, you know, and in fact, thinking back through practice, Ken, I can, I can think of, you know, a number of occasions where I've worked with clients and they're angry the person actually died. Yeah. They're angry the person actually died. And it's real anger. And, you know, as Ken has often said, and I love Ken's phrase, all feelings are welcome in the therapy room. All feelings should be engaged with. And, you know, maybe you have to engage with that. It feels a little bit counterintuitive that you are angry at someone dying. But actually, that's the process, part of the process of letting go. And for some people, it can be a lifelong endeavour. Some people kind of move on and they, they move away. Other people may very well just have this cyclic um, re, uh, revisiting of the of the difficulties and the, the pain of loss. And others may, you know, quite frankly, not escape it at all. They, that might be a permanent position for them. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can definitely get stuck there. And I, I think to circle right back to where we began with this before we give you the special secret link to go and get Rory's super duper <laughs> handout on the Dabda model, then you can have it in, in, in your hand and you can look over that yourself. And, and that is that this is not linear and that it can go forward and backwards. So you, you can have an example where a client will be will have acceptance that the person is gone. And I, I, I'm speaking from my own personal uh, journey here, looking back over uh, the Christmas period, I, I lost my dad uh, over that time. And every time we come to that uh, time of year, um, I, I, I maybe feel myself getting slightly depressed, revisiting that depression uh, stage of things, even though I have the acceptance and I've had the acceptance now for decades, but I still go back there at this time of year. And you you mentioned it there, Rory, the little triggers that might be there. It might be a birthday, it might be an anniversary, it might be a festive yeah. uh, holiday where you might think back on that person. And you can very much move from acceptance to an, uh, another stage. Uh, it's it's a good model. It's a, it's worth having. It's not the be all and end all. And I wouldn't suggest if you are working with grief that this is your only model that you would work with. I would expand your your horizons on that. But it's certainly worth having, as you said, Rory. Simple to understand. Simple to, to teach somebody else. The Dabda model. Elizabeth Kubler asks, where can you get it? Go to counselingtutor.com. Uh, that's on my other website. Click on the podcast tab because that's what you're listening to. Find episode 249 right there on that page. You can download Rory's Super Duper Handout. <laughs> it's a Super Duper Handout. It's right there for you. And there it is. That is today's theory in practice. And we now move into our new section, uh, which is called Practice Today. So just before we go into what we're going to be talking about today in Practice Today, which is using translators in the therapy room, just give us a flavor of what we can expect, Rory, in Practice Today as we go forward. What's going to sit in this little section? Well, thank you, Ken. Yes, in, in this section, we're going to be talking about contemporary issues that therapists have to deal with, maybe things that they're not trained for, in their, in their first trainings or even in their CPD. And this is going to be more of a, a practical section where we look at um, issues that is, issues that come up and, you know, inspect and observe them from, from different angles. So if it happens to someone who's listened to this, we're going to be looking at translators today, people, have got a better, people who are listening have got a better idea of you know what actions they may take and how they may engage with it, so it's um, it's a it's a a kind of modern modern take on um, you know things that happen in therapy that sometimes we just don't train for or never even think about. Mm, I like that, and and of course, as we shouted out at the beginning of this episode, we'd love your input in this. We we want to know what you want to hear us discuss in this section and where can they let us know Rory which Facebook group should they go to <laughs> let me let me think Ken uh well if you go to Facebook and type in counseling tutor you'll find us we're a very welcoming site our moderators will let you in you can join thousands and thousands of like-minded people we have students we have qualified colleagues we have supervisors, we have a, a soup song of um, tutors, and they're all talking about current topics in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. So join join the party, come on in, we want to see you, we want to make you welcome, and ask your question. If you've got a question that you um, 
you, you want answering, just type in practice matters into the into the comment. And this is this is what what you want to, us to discuss. And if we can, we'll try and discuss it in this section of the podcast. I was looking in our very Facebook uh, uh, group this morning, Rory, in preparation for our chat today. And I put in translator to see what came up. And there's many, many discussions on having a translator in the room, including some nice links to uh, websites and, and one particular article that I was looking at, uh, at working where, where there's a suggestion that uh, hard of hearing people also need counseling you know and british, yeah. british sign language it was written in the uk is saying you know we need british sign language uh, uh, either to be taught to counselors or you need someone to interpret for for, for the person yeah yeah i mean that's that's a very interesting point ken british sign language yeah because because it is the clue is in the name it's british what happens if you get a client who's been taught sign language from a different a different country or a different model of sign language. And the whole thing about translation was generated by a, a conversation I had with a colleague who wrote to me a, a, about six or eight months ago, had attended our online and telephone counseling course and said, you know, how do you use, how, what happens if you got someone from another country who doesn't speak English or I can't speak their language? And I suggested a few things and she wrote back to me on her experience of using translators. So there's two ways of translation. You know, you can actually get somebody who is a translator. So I think we'll start there, Ken. And who do you get? And I'll tell you who you don't get to be a translator. You don't get a family member to be a translator. Yeah. Um, because what can happen is, is A, there may be some inhibition with the client. You know, if you've got someone who's talking about very intimate issues and they, they're using their child as a translator, they're not going to want to talk about that in front of their child. And also, um, it may be that, you know, if you're using a family member, the family member may not want the information spoken to the therapist, so they may not actually translate correctly. There was an interesting um, article on a court case where they had a translator in the court case, and um, the, the trial had to be stopped because one of the people in the public gallery was was actually a native speaker listening to a witness and said, um, "That's not what they said." Mm. The translator had, um, you know, either you know, because of the way translation is, sometimes there's different forms of language, isn't there, and, and it can be translated in different ways, or it was done deliberately. I mean, I have no evidence it was done deliberately. However, it just shows how important translation is. Mm. And, and you know, not to put too fine a point on it, you know, those who are working in services are now seeing people who are not native English speakers or English isn't their first language, and they need a service too. We've got, you know, refugees. We've got people coming from war zones who speak many different languages. And, you know, I think modern therapists, this is about contemporary practice, you know, we're going to have to think about how we're going to serve those clients. And, and language is an important part of therapy. It's everything in therapy, Ken. Yeah. And and I mean, there's the the third person in the room. Mm. I'm going to call it the third person in the room in that you have another uh, soul in the room with you, somebody else that is not related to this journey uh, that this that this client is going on that is listening to the information the client is giving and yeah. then putting that over how they understand it from their yeah. frame of reference. And I think what you're referring to in the court case, I don't know how yeah. that played out or what was going on there, but it it's so easy, isn't it? And I, I remember one of the uh, exercises we did in college when I was training under you on frame of reference was you would ask three people to look out of the window and yes. write down what they saw. And everybody wrote down something different. Why? We're looking through the same window at the same picture. But we all have a different frame of reference of that that attracts us. And if you look to books that are translated, yes. they're sometimes, oh, well, it's not the same. You know, when you translate it out of Sanskrit, there aren't the right words to put into yes. blah, 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 blah. So we have to recognize that there may be a break in the, the narrative. But I think what we can do when we're working with a translator is we can pay very close attention to body language and the nonverbal communication that may be coming from that client. We can see the emotion and maybe feel the emotion that they may convey in how they put that information over. Because at the end of the day, we're there with them in that emotion. Yes, we need to know the narrative. 
uh, but that emotion is vitally important. But uh, yes, you've got a third person in the room, but you've also maybe got another frame of reference to watch out for. Absolutely. And, and we could we, we'd probably do another contemporary practice discussion on, on, on how culturally people express things like grief sadness um because because people express them in different ways through different cultures you know okay. um and of course you know our whole conversation has been predicated ken on the fact that we're actually getting a person in to do the translation and that isn't always the case translators are expensive um you have to, you, you have to book them don't always turn up and the person who wrote to me used some translation software and what I want to do is just share some observations that she she shared with me about um, the the positives and slightly downsides of using tran- translation software. So for those of you who are thinking, well, what's translation software? If you Google Google Translate, you'll find that you can you can type English text in, and on the box on the right hand side, you get whatever language you want that comes out of it. So you know, English to French, French to English, German. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a sophisticated thing, quite a thing to see. Um, and that's the first that's the first place we'll go because the person who the person who wrote to me said that they tried they tried Google Translate, client writes down the issue, translates into English, and then you write down in their lang- in your language what, what your response is, and it translates into their language. Presumption of literacy. Mm. And that's the first hurdle that this person came across because the people she was dealing with had been um, effectively kidnapped. They hadn't been educated. Um, they're predominantly women. They hadn't been educated. They couldn't speak their own language because you know part of the part of the control was not giving people access to education. So um, that that fell a little bit at the at the first hurdle because if someone can't write, they can't use a translator. So that's the first thing to think about. And the other thing was that. Um, you know, so don't assume the client can read or write. Using technology takes practice. So if you're using technology, you need it need you need to practice, and that means practicing with someone who is a, a, a who's writing in a different language. That can be a bit tricky, yeah. and also um, the, the software might not actually be an accurate translation. That's that's the first thing, Ken. Yeah. So I mean, that's so useful. And also, she talked about um, the the kind of technology that they used. They got some tablets initially, and the tablets um, weren't very fast. They didn't connect to the internet. They connected to the internet, but their processing speed wasn't fast. But, and I'm paraphrasing this, um, it, it became a lot better when they used phones. And it struck me, Ken, that phones actually are probably meant for this because people carry them around. They're very compact. There's been a lot of effort put into translation software. If you go on the App Store or the Google, the Google Market where you buy your apps, there's huge amounts of, of translation software that can be downloaded onto a phone that sometimes you can't download onto a computer because the phone is a very handy thing. So there's a, there's a lot, there's there is a lot to think about. Yeah. And I think finally, Ken, if you're working in a busy practice in, in a city. What's the what's the policy on translation? Have you is there a policy? I can remember many years ago when I was working uh, for a charity just down the road from where I lived, um, and I was the chair of it. <laughs> I was the chair, and someone phoned up and said, "We've got a lot of people speaking French. We think they're speaking French in our reception, and they're getting very they're getting very upset." And someone had tried to engage them in A level holiday French, and that hadn't gone down too well. And eventually, we got an interpreter in, and. Um, and it took some sorting out to to you know to be able to get the get the people who needed the help to the translator, and we had to get a budget for that. So it's it's a big thing, but we are becoming a more um, diverse society in terms of language. I was out and about yesterday locally. I, I live in a you know quite a small part of the world, and I had at least two languages being spoken that weren't English. And yeah. they were people who lived in my area. They were, they're, they're my neighbours. <laughs> they're my neighbours. Now, they may very well speak English as a first language, but who knows? Yeah, it, it's a very, very interesting topic. And I think <clears throat> as as technology grows, uh, as, as we do more work online, 
uh, there are that more maybe opportunities to work across cultures, across language barriers. Um, I think I, I, I have a colleague who is a polyglot, uh, and, and she worked as an interpreter for many, many years. She now teaches languages. She's doing a lot of work with uh, refugees. Um, and <clears throat> from her experience, if you're looking for a translator, you're, you're maybe best looking at professional translator services where you can hire somebody where they have a code of conduct, where they will understand about confidentialities. Because, of course, um, uh, interpreters are used in sensitive situations all the time uh, in governmental meetings with for foreign dignitaries. There will be a translator there. Um, so it, it, it is not it's not too unusual, but it does carry with it an expense it can sometimes be quite a considerable expense mm. i think it's something to weigh up and have a think about of is that for you within your practice and i wouldn't want to leave this topic without putting out a a, a disclaimer when we are speaking about things like google translate and, and apps that can be used for translation we are in no way suggesting that you nope. use any of these apps it is that the, the sad thing is that so often the information that you might be putting into that app, which is maybe not yours to put in, maybe the client, you're getting a client to type in what they're feeling, they're sharing their deepest secrets. How is that being protected? Who owns that data? Where is that data being stored? Who looks at that data? That is That all comes way before the convenience yeah. of these apps. They can look so shiny and so easy. Uh, and of course, if you're out on holiday in a, in a country and you just need to get by and find a, a restaurant, then they're great for that. But Think really carefully when putting sensitive data into any, any application. Look first and foremostly at how that data is protected and managed. Wow. I don't think we'd reach the end of this uh, topic if we spoke for another hour, Rory. It's, it's oh, we could another hour so easily, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Join that conversation. This is our new uh, section. It's called Practice Today. What's happening in practice today? Today we spoke about translation in the therapy room. Uh, weigh in. Tell us your thoughts. Facebook, put into Counseling Tutor. Join that conversation. Uh, we now move on to Practice Matters. This is the CPD section of the Counseling Tutor podcast. And you can put this down as CPD, you know, in, on your CPD, uh, what, what do you call it? The way you record sheet. your audit. Yeah, audit. your sheet. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the big sheet. word, your, your CPD audit you can put in listening to the Counseling Tutor podcast as part of that CPD. Anything that you do in in um, service of your client or your practice as a counsellor can be classed as CPD. So put that down. And today we're going to uh, hear from Alan Fratt. You spoke with him, Rory, and he spoke about waking dreams. Yes, Alan, Alan, has, Alan has written a book, which we will allude to, and you'll be able to see the link to that in the in the show notes on Podcast 249. Um, but yes, he, he talks about waking dreams, the hinterland be, between um, our, our kind of day-to-day -day experience and also our, our fantasy experience it's a really interesting um piece of thinking and i caught up with alan Fratt, and this is what he had to say about it and we welcome alan freighter who's written a book entitled waking dreams imagination in psychotherapy and everyday life so first of all alan welcome and thank you for joining us Thanks for having me along, Rory. Nice to be here. So waking dreams in psychotherapy. So I guess the first question is, what are waking dreams? It's in the, it's in this, what it says on the tin. So it's like a mixture of waking and dreaming. So a waking dream, the easiest way to, well, maybe from experience, your audience, I'd imagine a lot of them will have had the experience of waking up in the morning and you're still in a dreamscape but you know you're in your bed. That happens spontaneously sometimes. A waking dream is therefore an overlap of an imagined reality, the dreamscape, with being in the normal physical world. And a waking dream practice is about learning the conditions to create that in-between state and explore it uh, with the client. So would this be working with subconscious processes is my question i guess 
we we work therapists tend to work in here now working with waking dreams is there is there a connection to sub subconscious process here well i guess it just depends what you mean by subconscious but um what i'm what i'm interested in but it gives us the opportunity to work with the spontaneously arising imagery that's there in the psyche in the unconscious and the subconscious so we're, we're work that's the emphasis in in the book is on how to notice validate enhance explore because because that spontaneously arising imagery is psychologically relevant so it's not like there's a lot of like active imagination or guided imagery books that give scripts to take people on a journey up a mountain or whatever that's not so much what i'm interested in what i'm for what, what waking dreams allow us to do is enter into and participate in the imagery that's there already yeah so the the, the in a in a co-created relationship the therapist can explore the meanings with the client so i guess that's the the thrust of it is it it's explore the meaningfulness is how i put it so it's i mean in terms of therapy how i see it is that the raw datum if you like is images i mean i would say that because I, I consider myself to be a sort of image centric practitioner mm. so you know you get body centered people or, or people who are interested in cognitive emphasis but for me memories are images and we spend a lot of time talking about memories, future fantasies, the worry about next week or whatever. That's a, an imagined reality that overlaps with the physical reality of the consulting room. And similarly, the, the transference, how the um, client or patient sees the therapist, the story that they tell about us, or indeed how they interact in the room with a teddy bear or a drawing or a painting or whatever. That's, that's images too. So, the 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 waking dream practice allows us to uh, land that and enter into an exploration of it, not to figure out what it means so much. I'm more interested in an experiential process, which is meaningful. Um, we can we can figure out what it means afterwards if we want to. Like when you wake up from a dream and you wonder what it means, it's kind of like a knee-jerk reaction to waking up in the morning. But what's exciting for me about waking dream practice is it gives us an opportunity to enter into the dreamscape, if you like, or the memory or the future fantasy, or to work in the moment in the room in an embodied experiential way with the imagery and to hang loose to trying to figure it out because that can kind of shut things down and we turn images into ideas and the imagining becomes thinking and that can be a safe place to go. That can be like comfortable place, an interesting place, but I like to carve out the opportunity to allow the client to inhabit the imagery for a while. I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting form of practice. And I, I wonder are, are some, clients better suited to this type of work than others i mean can you when you when you engage with a client can you mm. see that some clients may benefit more or or may may have a, a a more meaningful experience in therapy by using um waking dream i think i think generally speaking it's applicable across the board now okay. that might seem a little bit heterodox because conventionally working with images, working with images is contraindicated for perhaps people with overactive imaginations or people who are a little bit less stable. Um, cause we don't want to, uh, cause the fear is that working with images takes them further into a fantasy life. Mm. For me, given that we can't get away from images because they are the memories, perceptions, and future fantasies that are happening all the time. For me, it's more about how you work with the images. And I, I make a distinction between working with them in an eyes closed 
waking dream, which is the more conventional way. You close your eyes and have a journey or whatever. What I've what I present in the book is a is also a way to do it with your eyes open. And then that way the client remains grounded in the room with you. They're not completely disappearing into the the wilderness of fantasy life. Um, and we can work with images in a safe way with with most people. Um, so yeah, that's that's I mean it can be really helpful for I mean I mean some people don't think they're very imaginative and therefore they might have hang-ups around working in this way. For me, that's about clarifying for myself as a therapist and also to the client what we mean by an image. What does it mean to get an image? Most, pe- most people have an outlandish assumption that it's like to enter into some kind of three-dimensional Walt Disney fantasy where the normal world disappears. But as we defined earlier, a waking dream is you're still in the normal world and you have an imaginal overlap. And that's a subtle sense that everyone can have. You just need to remember what you had for breakfast and that's an image. So you're still here and you've got an image. So I think clarifying what we mean by an image can um, get around that. And also the eyes open thing can avoid the self-consciousness that people might have. Sometimes if you get them to do like an experiment, like an eyes closed thing, they get very self-conscious or they want to do it really, really well. And that gets in the way. But if we do it in an eyes open way, then the therapy doesn't get in the way of the therapy. But I think one last point on that question is, I think particularly for more sort of mentally identified people, people are a bit more in their head who perhaps don't know what they feel or don't really have a lot of body awareness. I think as an opening into experiential work, most mentally identified people can become aware of images. And then that takes us into feelings and bodily sensations, because imagination isn't just visuals. Imagination is like a nexus of all the senses and feelings and thoughts together. It's a it's a fascinating form of practice. I mean, you know, phenomenology and, you know, as Martin Hygen just said, I'm quoting from the book, we do not have a body, rather we are bodily. Um, you know, this idea of, of, of a, of a um, lived, almost visceral experience of existence, which I think... I think Heidinger kind of outlined a little bit more than Husserl. Um, my, if my my research and my, my studies are correct. Um, gives us this sense of, of a, a lived, literally a lived experience. But this seems to be more about, about expanding that lived experience to in, encompass. And when I talked earlier about um, subconscious, that that may not be in awareness was what I was referring to. So, I guess right. my, I guess to modify my question yes. is to ask: Does this then bring? Does this bring up things that were not you in awareness yes. that right. the client can take away and and inspect in their own time? Yeah, I think um, I understand. I think if we think of a a spectrum from fantasy to an ever increasing imaginal accuracy or sensibility, so. We can think of like a client's presenting issue Mm. as them being stuck in a habitual story about who they are and the world around them and what they expect from that world. So that's the first thing, to find out what story, which is to say the images, the imaginal narrative that people are caught up in, that will be reflected in in the imagery in waking dream practice. It's it's kind of remarkable, but you know you want. But if your waking dream has a dragon in a cave or something to cartoon it a little bit, obviously when you open your eyes, you won't find a dragon at the end of the garden behind the shed. But there will be dragon-like people and cave-like places in your actual life. It's like it. It's like it's kind of like a condensed form of the activity of images that we're participating in. It's not random, so it it, it reflects 
the current identity, if you like. And then the beauty is, I talk about novel images. It's like somewhere in the waking dream, there will be a standout image. There'll be something that interrupts or impinges upon that habitual story. And the waking dream practice is all about allowing uh, an, an opening to explore that new possibility. So it's kind of like if the habitual story is like repetitive and a, a state of suffering, it's like we're we're looking for a crack in the story fabric of everyday life and helping people to enter into a new story and to participate with a wider field of images, which is to say relationships, activities, places, ways of being, sense of belonging. And um, so, I mean, that's why we're doing it, right? It's, you're trying to help people reimagine their sense of self and, and the world. Yes, and I think I think it, it speaks to script, life script in general, that, doesn't it? You know, if you think of the TA view of life script, that we repeat patterns of behaviour, to to be able to have a window of another opportunity to to see how our life may be or could be then that's that's a wonderful thing isn't it and i guess the whole point of of therapy so i guess my final question on on this fascinating subject that i i we could have a good hour on this i, I would okay. have, I, we could is if someone's really interested in in this type of work and this type of encounter with clients where would they go to find out more information is there training around this or is this something that which one develops as a practitioner through inquiry and reflection the simplest thing to do would be to read my book which is called waking dreams imagination in psychotherapy and everyday life um i've got a website a website called wildimagination.uk which has lots of free stuff on it and videos so it fleshes out what we've just spoken about. You can read the beginning of the book on the website, wildimagination.uk. I also run a course based on the book, an online course. Um, beyond that, it's a bit niche where I'm coming from. I mean, other sources are Robert Bosnak. He's a young and dream worker. Um, James Hillman, uh, re Revisioning Psychology. Uh, classic text. Um, Stephen K. Levine, mm. he's a he's a wonderful art therapist. So there's stuff out there. Um, but if you go to my website, there's resources and links and reading lists and videos you could try there. Sure. Well, we'll put those links into the show notes of the podcast. Um, I've started to read the book, and I'm I'm starting to get quite um, enamoured with the idea of of of, of of waking waking dreams and that borderline between kind of reality and and that kind of embodied experience of who we may be so um i i've got a free copy of the book complete transparency here i got a free copy of the book free books you know always great so i i, I am in, i am genuinely in, enjoying the, the opening chapters so with that said Alan Freighter, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Alan. A big thank you to you, Rory, for reaching out and, and holding that really interesting uh, interview. It's uh, uh, I, I'd like to read the book. I haven't read the book. I would like to read the book. I'll certainly be looking at the show notes page, counsellingtutor.com, uh, podcast tab, episode 249, to have a look for the link to the book. Uh, that is uh, Alan Fratt on the topic of waking dreams and i do believe rory this is a, there's a bit of a rumor here i'm gonna to have to go for you for confirmation on this rumor that alan may be in the pipeline for making a lecture for the counselor cpd library so that's worth looking out for uh, absolutely absolutely we um we were so impressed with what what he had to say yeah. that we invited him to to do a lecture and he's, he's going to be scheduled in as one of our lectures and i i mean having, having started to read the book yeah, I don't think this is a lecture to be missed once we once we produce it. Can nice one. And if you're not a member of the Counselor CPD Library, it's so easy to join. You just go to counsellingtutor.com, and the information is right there on the screen. An annual membership to the Counselor CPD Library will cost you less than the price of one cup of coffee per month out with a friend. So it really is worth it. It's absolutely jam packed full 
of quality CPD, uh, all with learning objectives, all certified. Uh, so go and check that out, counselingtutor.com. This has been episode 249, the Counselling Tutor Podcast. Yes, we started with theory and practice, stages of grieving. We looked at the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the enduring piece of theory that um, that has helped so many. And we looked at it in a little bit more detail and hope that is of help to you if you ever need to use that theory with your clients. Practice today is a new section. We're looking at contemporary issues in counselling. And Ken and myself talked about using translators in the therapy room, something that is really is a contemporary issue in the society that we find ourselves in. And then finally, in Practice Matters, I caught up with Alan Fratt, who talked about waking dreams in psychotherapy, an interesting direction taken in in a in a new idea of how people interact with the world. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. <laughs>